Good morning. It is great to be with you this morning, and uh, once again, sort of unexpectedly, but it is a great privilege to join you not only today as we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent and have lit the fourth candle, but also uh, I'm planning to be with you on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and what a treat that will be to be here um, at Pilgrim. Uh, before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for delivering us safely to this place so that we might praise and honor and worship you, spend this time together in community. Lord, we ask that this time of reflection on your word as we meditate together would be a time when you are glorified, when we are edified. Lord, thank you for building us up and for encouraging us in your word. May this time be a blessing to us in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to talk about the now and the not yet, and we're going to reflect on the passage from Isaiah. Uh, it's Christmas time, it's Advent, technically. Christmas is not here yet, and for a lot of people there's a uh, surprise when I share that. Having grown up Lutheran, I think we understand the church year better than some, and when I tell people it's not Christmas yet, uh, they kind of look at me like, well, sure it is. All the shopping malls say so. Um, but we are in the season of Advent, a season of preparation, and upon Christmas Day, Christmas starts. And there are 12 days of Christmas between the 25th of December and the 6th of January, which is Epiphany. And in that time, we celebrate the birth of our Savior and the coming of our Lord. And there are verses that prepare us for that. And here, as we stand on the fourth Sunday of Advent, the, uh, gospel, or the, the message, the first lesson, the prophet Isaiah speaks... And there is a story of him speaking the words of God to a king named Ahaz. I'm going to read that again. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. What a treat it is for me to stand here on the last Sunday of Advent on the cusp of Christmas, leaning forward on tiptoe with breathless anticipation of the celebration of Christ's birth. Brightly wrapped packages under beautifully decorated trees hold the promise of joy and laughter and satisfaction on a crisp Christmas morning. Looking forward to family gathering, great food, and even better conversation as we relax together by a warm, crackling fire. It's a wonderful image of Christmas we've created through the years. Perhaps this year, that's not true for all of us. Perhaps Christmas isn't a time of breathless wonder, full of joy and family. Maybe. Christmas is a time of hopeless desperation, loneliness, countless reminders that your life isn't going the way you hoped. Maybe right now isn't so good for you, and the joy, peace, hope, and comfort of Christmas has not yet settled on your life. Maybe for some in this room, Christmas has never been the Norman Rockwell painting of holiday cheer. There may be some of us here today still anticipating a better time to come, but it just hasn't, not yet. And our now is really hard with no let up in sight. This morning I want to talk about those two time frames, the now and the not yet. Our lesson from Isaiah is a word of prophecy well known and loved. It's read Every Christmas a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. 
But did you know this prophecy was not originally spoken as an announcement of the birth of Christ? In fact, it's entirely likely and most certain that Isaiah had no clue his words would, become, would come to be used in reference to the birth of Messiah. You see, he was speaking to a much, much more contemporary issue. Ahaz was an awful king, awful by any standard, and especially those standards established by David, who sat in the throne, second to Saul, but the king whom everyone looked to as the model. Fourteenth to sit on the throne of David, Ahaz ruled for 16 years, from about 731 B.C. to 715 B.C. And this is a critical time in the Middle East. Judah was the land that Ahaz was ruling, I'm going to go back, I'm going to geek out a little on, on Old Testament history with you, if you just bear with me for a second. So, after David came Solomon, and Solomon reigned, he built the temple, but he also built his palace complex. He also built several temples around in the high places for some of his wives, of which he had 700 and 300 concubines. And after his death, the kingdom was split into the northern kingdom, which retained the name of Israel, and the southern kingdom, which retained the name of Judah, became named Judah, and which had as its capital Jerusalem. So Ahaz sits in the throne of David, which stayed in Jerusalem in the land of Judah. But he was at odds now with the northern kingdom of Israel. So those kingdoms are split. That's how that happens. So King Pekah of Israel and King Rezin of Syria are now attacking Jerusalem and they're attacking Ahaz. So there is a conflict going on. There's been much loss and Ahaz is fearful that Jerusalem will be conquered and he will be subjected to the kings of Syria and Israel. In the meantime, to the west, the Philistines have captured some land and to the north, the Edomites have captured land and caused trouble. So Ahaz is just harassed on all sides. And he has given himself over to the worship of false gods. He is, in fact, uh, reputed to have sacrificed one of his sons in the fires to Molech. So he has completely abandoned God. But God sends Isaiah to Ahaz. And he spoke these words of God to Ahaz, sent him with a message of encouragement. It was actually an invitation from God to ask God for a sign that would give him the strength he needed to make it through this difficulty that he was in. And Ahaz, having little or no regard for God, made the excuse that he did not think it appropriate to put God to the test. Even though God himself had asked him and made the offer that he would give him a sign. Not only that, but God put no limits on the sign. He said, ask anything you want from as deep as Sheol, which was the Israelite word for the grave or death, and as high as heaven, anything you want, you ask. And Ahaz says, no. He refused God's invitation to hear a word of encouragement. You see, Ahaz had already pretty much made up his mind how he was going to deal with the situation. He was going to take matters into his own hands and surrender the sovereignty of Judah to Tiglath-Pileser. Tiglath-Pileser was the ruler of Assyria. And I'll explain what this whole surrender to Tiglath-Pileser means in just a minute. So Isaiah forges ahead in his meeting with Isaiah. And he says, I'm going to give you a sign from God anyway. God wants you to stop relying on your own understanding, stop making your own plans. So here's a promise from him to calm your fears. A woman is now or soon will be pregnant. Often God instructed his prophets to use a child's name as a part of the prophecy. And in this case, it's no different. The name of the child will be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So he goes on to tell Ahaz that by the time this child reaches the age of reason, commonly accepted as about 12 years old, the kings who are harassing him will be gone. They will no longer be a concern. So you see, it was very much a contemporary uh, statement of encouragement from Isaiah to Ahaz. A woman with child 
will give birth and before that child is 12 years old, the kings you're worried about and that you are willing to give over the sovereignty of Judah to Tiglath-Pileser for will be gone. Your battle will be over. So in other words, God is telling Ahaz, hang in there. Don't do anything stupid and stop depending on your own understanding based on current circumstances. The circumstances are about to change. The danger you're currently experiencing will pass, and most importantly, God is with you. Now here's the very cool thing about prophecy and the Word of God. Isaiah was speaking very strongly to the now Ahaz was experiencing, but he was also speaking the God-inspired words that apply to the coming Messiah, the not yet. The now Ahaz needed to hear was that God was with him in that moment and even then was in the midst of a plan to keep Jerusalem from being conquered by Pekah of Israel and Razan of Syria. And the not yet the people of Israel and all of humanity needed to hear about a coming Messiah who would rescue all of us from sin, death, and the power of the devil were spoken at the same exact time with the same exact words. the now and the not yet addressed in the words of prophecy. Now sadly, Ahaz disregarded the words of Isaiah and the sign from God that a woman with child would give birth and before that child reached the age of reason, 12 years old, he would be out from under the attack of the two kings and instead he went ahead with his plan and sent a a delegation to Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria with gifts and a pledge saying, this is what he said, I am your servant and son. Save me from the hands of the kings of Syria and Israel who have gone to war against me. In other words, Ahaz gave himself and his people into the hands of a tyrant rather than trust God. But it doesn't end there. Sure enough, Tiglath-Pileser marched on Syria and conquered them. And in 721 BC, Assyria crushed Israel and took them into captivity. And when the Assyrians crushed the northern kingdom of Israel, they dispersed them, the diaspora. They spread them out among the Assyrian conquered lands so that they could not stay together as a community. And over time, those Israelites came back together again many hundreds of years later and were known as Samaritans. So sure enough, in less than 12 years, the kings that Ahaz was afraid of were gone. God had kept his promise even though Ahaz had refused to hear it. And because he had acted on his own and out of his own will, Judah was now a subject nation to Assyria. Ahaz adopted their worship practices. He even saw an altar in the Assyrian capital that he was so impressed with, he had a copy made and placed it in the temple in Jerusalem, effectively a total rejection of God and a perversion of worship in God's temple. So here's the Advent message in all of this. God kept his promise regardless of Ahaz's response. Not only did he keep his promise to Ahaz that a woman would conceive and bear a son, and before that son reached the age of reason, both kings afflicting him would be gone, but he kept the deeper prophetic promise, a promise even Isaiah didn't understand that he was making, the promise to send a savior for all of humanity for all of time. A promise that a virgin would conceive by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit and give birth to a son, a son whose name would be Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And Jesus was very much with us then and is with us now and is with us in the not yet. Because we have an additional promise from Jesus, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Here's the thing about God. He keeps his promises no matter what. And whether or not we believe these promises doesn't matter. The Bible is full of promises God made to his people, to us, to you, to me. 
Promises of his constant presence, of his love, of his care, of his power that has been bestowed on us. Promises that are not dependent on our current circumstances. Hear that. Promises that are not dependent on our current circumstances, but are dependent on the capacity of God to keep his promises. And his capacity is without limit. This means God cannot make a promise that he can't keep. People make promises they can't keep. They sign contracts and warranties and make agreements like what I showed the children. And all of us can point to a time when such things ended up being not even worth the paper they were written on. But not so with God. So here's where this ancient story of Ahaz connects with you, with Advent, with Christmas. In many ways, you and I are no different from Ahaz. We go through times in our lives when we're under assault. Forces seem marshaled against us, committed to our destruction. It just might be, even today, your marriage relationship, your job, your health, your emotional well-being is under attack. And God calls you to ask him for encouragement, a sign, if you will. Instead, we all too often declare our troubles are not worth taking to God and we'll figure it out on our own. At least I'm willing to admit that that's been my response in life far too often. It's okay, God, I can take care of this. Even now, I'm working on a plan to make sure that everything gets better. There are people I can talk to, things I can give up. I'll surrender myself to a tyrant because I'd rather be in charge of my own situation. And God, our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, makes his promises anyway. Promises that address our now and our not yet. Promises that could provide comfort, peace, strength, and hope in the middle of our current situation, while at the same time pointing us to the best possible eternal future with him. I'm going to get a little more pointed with you now. God has a promise, a concern, a solution to any situation in which you currently find yourself. There is nothing going on with anyone in this room that isn't already addressed by God. Nothing. To believe otherwise and pursue your own solutions is to rest in the arrogance of Ahaz. It is a doomed path resulting in subjugation and fealty to a petty tyrant. Today, right now, stop trying to figure out your struggles on your own. Turn and ask God for a sign. Dig into the word he has given us and find all the many promises therein. Rest in the knowledge that he alone can keep every promise. Trust He not only knows your current situation, your now, he can give you all you need to live into the not yet. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of an eternal promise. God is with us. He is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know what that means for you, but for me it means there has never been a time in my life from the very worst time to the very best time when God has not been smack dab in the middle of it. There's never been an experience he didn't understand, and there's never been a promise he hasn't kept or isn't in the middle of keeping right now. But Tim, I can point to specific examples where God has not followed through. I've read his promises and clung to them and was disappointed. If that's what some of you are thinking right now, I hear you. And I have what may be some disappointing news. Your life, this world, and all that goes on in it isn't about you. And God's promises aren't limited to a single life cycle or a couple of generations. The sign Isaiah promised came in 732 B.C. That's about 732 years before Christ was born. There were many generations of people who were born, lived, and died before that promise was realized. 
Abraham was promised offspring that would be as many as the sands on the beach or the stars in the sky. He was promised land. And when he died, he had one son and a burial plot for him and his wife. Moses was promised the promised land. He spent 40 years in the wilderness, and he only glimpsed the promised land, but he never entered it. God is always in the midst of keeping promises, some that will occur in our lifetime, others that have happened before us and will happen after us. God does indeed make promises for the now and for the not yet. The promise for the now is that he is with us. He does not forsake us. He does not turn his face from us, even for an instant. Other promises for now are found in Jesus. We are forgiven all our sins right now. We have freedom from shame and guilt right now. We have the blessing of the community of believers right now. Together and individually, we have blessings we are called to share with those in need. The widow, the orphan, the imprisoned, the sick, the homeless, and the refugee right now. In fact, there are ways that you and I are the fulfillment of God's promises to the world. Here's my final encouragement to you this morning. Find the promises God has made to you. Remind yourself of every promise he's kept in your life and know with unwavering certainty he is even now in the midst of keeping every promise. Those that address your now and those anticipating your not yet. In finding those promises you will discover or rediscover the hope that Advent is all about. Amen.